Well, I bring greetings from Northwest Arkansas. I am uh, I'm thrilled to be able to be here and be a part of this, uh, this series of lessons that you all have. And, and I have to thank Garrett for the, uh, the topics that he gave me and uh, that ch challenge me and, and hopefully challenge others to the study that we've been uh, looking at uh, throughout the day today. And, and uh, I, am, I am excited when uh, I teach this series. Um, I have to give credit first and foremost to uh, Brother Stafford North. Um, the, a lot of the material and the things that I'm going to be using tonight um, are, are things that I have gleaned from his teaching. Uh, and if you have sat at the feet of Stafford North in the past, then you know how excellent of a teacher that he is. And uh, I went to a lectureship when I first year uh, out, of, out of school, I graduated from Bear Valley Bible Institute. And, and as a 25 year old man, I hear that Stafford North is going to teach a lesson on Revelation. He's going to do it in five lessons, the entire book. And I just went to see if it was possible. And, uh, and I was so overwhelmed by what he did that afterwards I approached him and I asked him, I said, are you okay if I use the, what you just taught? I took copious notes. And, uh, and he said, that's why I do what I do. And, uh, and so a lot of that is what I'm going to be sharing with you. I also have some images that are, I'm going to be using here as well. And I, uh, every time I do these lessons, I want to give credit to uh, a woman by the name of Pat Marvinko Smith. Um, she is an artist, and what she do, has done is she has taken and painted the pictures of the Revelation. There's not any, um, any interpretation into what those pictures mean in her art. She just simply looks at what the description in the Revelation is, is giving, and she paints that picture. And I've only got a couple of them here in this, this one tonight, but um, I also asked her for permission if I could use her artwork in these lessons, and uh, she also was thrilled for me to be able to do that. So this, this one particular question, what does revelation mean? Now we can look at this in various ways. Revelation of Scripture, what God gives us. I know that's not the, the topic of, of uh, what was intended here, uh, but the revelation that we have, this book that we have been given, given to us, inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. And so as we have the revelation of God, the final and closing book of the Bible, given to us, written by John, inspired and given. As a matter of fact, in the first few verses of the book of Revelation, you see that that it was God that delivered that message through an angel that delivered that message to John and, and in this vision that John was blessed to have. And so when we look at this book, there are so many different views, different ways that people have tried to interpret the book of Revelation. And so by looking at the, all of the different views, the clicker's not working, Garrett. There, there, are, there are so many different views. I've really just kind of looked at five particular ones, some of the most popular ones. Uh, the, first, the first being uh, what I'm going to refer to as the fall of Rome. And that is an interpretation of the book of, of Revelation to where the, the, uh, uh, the whole story that is given is a description of, there we go, of the Roman Empire and its history and its fall, and actually how God was involved with the fall of Rome. That's one view. Another view, some look at this as uh, an interpretation of the fall of Jerusalem. That's one in 70 AD that the Revelation is talking about the fall of the city of Jerusalem at that time. There are some that look at the book of Revelation, and it's called sometimes the religious and political history of the world. In other words, it's a way that is interpreted in which the history of the world is given in symbolic pictures, but it's given in various ways. You'll see in pieces that they'll try to interpret and see things like the Roman Catholic Church and how it has formed and various popes that came over time. They'll, they'll see images in the Revelation that they'll say refer to individuals like 
like Martin Luther and John Calvin and others who are leaders in the Reformation movement in the 1500s. They'll, they'll say that you can see uh, Muhammad and Islam in part of the Revelation. They'll, they'll say that you can see uh, America coming to power and falling one day as well. And, and it's just, this is an interpretation of Revelation that some take that you can see the whole history of the world um, from beginning to end in the book of Revelation. There's another that is similar to this that is known as repeating principles interpretation. And this is a view of the revelation where the persecution of Christians is seen throughout the book of Revelation, but it's not talking about any one particular period of time. When you read Revelation, it gives you images of what persecution was like for Christians in the first century. It also gives you images of what persecution was like in the, the, the medieval times. It get, also gives you images of what persecution is like for Christians during uh, our, our current time, the 21st century. They, they look at the persecution of Christians and how it could affect Christians at any time. And so that's kind of uh, a, a, another way of looking at this. Probably one of the most common views many in the religious world uh, hold to is what I'll refer to as a futurist view, is referred to a lot of times as a premillennial view. This is one where it is a prediction of, of things that are always surrounding the second coming of Christ. That revelation is an image, a picture of the things that are going to happen when Christ returns again. So there are a lot of different terminology and words that you'll hear that come from this interpretation. The words like the rapture and seven-year tribulation and the thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth and, and uh, Armageddon and many of those things that, that uh, are, are all tied together into this interpretation of, of the book of Revelation. My question, and this is only five of many different ways that people look at this book, because this book is, it's a strange book. There's a lot of strange things that we find in it. A lot of, of, of pictures and things we're gonna talk about here in just a moment. But my question in looking at all this is which, which one of these views best fits what the Bible says about itself? At the uh, area wide last night, Boo Scott, the lesson that he gave, he brought out the point that when we're studying the Bible and studying scripture, one of the things that we need to understand and focus on is let the Bible be the Bible. Let what the Bible says just simply be what the Bible says. Uh, there's so many times in interpretation that man adds in their own thoughts and their own ideas and their own opinions, their own feelings into what something means or what it should, what, what it's, how it's supposed to be interpreted. And that is a dangerous way to approach Scripture. Just let the Bible say what the Bible says. Let it be what it is and allow the Bible to interpret itself. So many people are afraid of the book of Revelation because there are a lot of strange things in it and they shy away from it because it's so hard to understand. But it's really not. It really isn't. And that's one of the things that I want to do this evening is maybe share with you just a couple of things to where you can begin to see like, oh, maybe I can understand what this is talking about. Now, Stafford North, as I said, his material, the seven keys to the unlock the book of Revelation, I'd recommend to anybody. It is fantastic. And I'm going to be looking at some of these keys and uh, some, some various aspects of these ways of unlock. I'm not going to look at all seven of these. Um, we're going to look at, at uh, maybe five and possibly a sixth one. Um, so uh, buckle your seatbelts because we're going to have to move through this pretty quick. This is Garrett saying, you get one lesson to teach the book of Revelation, the entire book. And so uh, you're going to have to buckle up as we go through this. The first thing that I want to point out is the fact that the book of Revelation is written in symbols. Now, this is something that is stated from the very beginning of the book. Now, immediately when you open up the book of Revelation, you see all of these things. It's different than any other book of the Bible. 
There are a few other places in Ezekiel, maybe the end of Daniel, that you also see the picturesque um, descriptions of things like we see in Revelation. And that actually becomes very important when we're studying the book of Revelation. But you open this up and you see dragons. And you see seven-headed monsters. And you see all kinds of strange pictures that are there. And a lot of people are afraid of that. They're not sure what to do with that. How do I interpret and understand what these things mean? But symbolic language is very common. It was very common in the first century at that time. They would use this type of symbolic language to describe various things. They would use numbers in specific ways to try to emphasize and describe things. We do the same thing today. We, we use a lot of, of expressions in our language to describe things. If I were here tonight and I said, I am freezing to death. Really? I'm on the verge of death. You know exactly what I mean by that. You know that I'm making a statement that it's cold. But we use a, a very strong language to get that point across. How many of you as parents have made a statement of something like, I have told you a million times. Really? A million? And there's some moms that are going, yep, it's definitely at least a million times. We know that that's not literal. We know that that's not exactly what you mean, but we know exactly what you mean by it. You're using a picture to help us understand the meaning behind something. It's not new. This is something that has happened through the ages. Back in ancient times when, when the book of Revelation was being written, it was used that way as well. And so we need also have to remember that we are a different culture than those that the Revelation was originally written to. We speak a different language than they spoke. We are 2,000 years removed from when it was originally written. And so, and also we're halfway around the planet from those it was originally written to. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to us that some of the language and some of the pictures and the, the images that are given there might be a little bit challenging for us to understand. But again, if we let the Bible interpret itself, it helps us to be able to see these pictures a lot more clearly. This idea that it's written in symbols is given to us right in the very first verse. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave, gave Him to show to His bondservants the things which must soon take place. And He sent and com communicated it by His angel to His bondservant John. The word that's used here, is in communicated, that's a word that's used in the New American Standard. There are some translations that will use the word signified. And that was because that is the word that is being, being meant here. The communication that God is using through John in this book is a signified language. The word sign is within that word. He's using signs, he's using pictures, he's using figurative language and figurative images to be able to get this message across. You know, when uh, symbols and pictures leave a understandable message, I'm, I wasn't going to do this, but I, I, I'm going to just because of time, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. I want you to imagine that, if you want to close your eyes, you can, if you don't, but imagine with me. You're standing on a hill, and you look down across the rolling hills that lead down into the valley. And the silvery green grass in the meadow, it looks like the sea as waves that roll across it from one end of the valley to the other. About a stone's throw away from you, there's a fence that has a single rusty barbed wire strand loosely connected to it. Most of the wooden fence posts have long since rotted or fallen over, leaving most of the fence hidden in the grass. At the bottom of the valley is a small but steady stream that flows, uh, and even from a distance, it seems like you can see the bottom, the rocks in the bottom of its bed. Next to the creek is a single stately elm tree that would take three grown men to completely wrap their arms around it. 
You are in awe of the appearance because of its foliage that appears to be on fire as the sun displays its brilliance. Okay, that's the picture. Now let me ask you some questions. Was the grass tall or was it short? Was it a calm or a windy day? Was the fence new or was it old? Was the stream clear or was it murky? Was the elm tree young or old? What season of the year was it? All of those questions that have answers, was the grass tall? It was tall, wasn't it? I never said that it was tall. I painted a picture for you that the silvery green grass in the meadow looks like a sea as waves roll across it from one end to the other. I never said that it was tall. Was it a calm day? Well, that same picture, I never said it was windy. But we know it was because of the picture that was painted. That was the fence new or old? I never said the fence was old. But it had a rusty wire on it. And most of the posts had fallen down. But I never said it was old. We can go through all of these different questions and you really see the picture that is painted has given you information about something without actually saying it. And that's what the revelation does. Revelation is made up of pictures that God is painting in our minds to help us see another message. And that's an amazing thing, an amazing way uh, of what God is doing with that. Now, secondly, it is also written about events that must soon take place. Now, Again, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the very first verse, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. Now, this word soon in this passage is in the Greek, it's the word takos. I kind of like that word. And it's easy to remember. When is the best time to eat tacos? Soon. So, soon is a word that's used throughout the New Testament. And so some people try to say, well, what exactly does that mean? That the things in are written here in the Revelation must soon take place. Well, let's look at another example. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and, uh, and verse 9, he says, make every effort, Timothy, to, to come to me soon. He uses the exact same word, tacos, there in that, in that verse. Now, we see the further context here a little bit later in verse 13 when Paul says, When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. We can see from the context of, of 2 Peter chapter 4 that when Paul uses the, the word soon, tacos, to, to uh, Timothy, he's saying, I want you to come immediately. Don't wait very long. It's something that needs to happen in a very short period of time. That's the same word that John uses in Revelation 1 and verse 1. These things that must take place soon. And so that begins to give us a little bit of context to the timeline of the Revelation. It's something that John is saying that the things that are written in this book, there's not going to be a lot of time that passes before we begin to see the things that are recorded here begin to take place. We see a lot of time elements that, go, that, that describe this throughout the book of Revelation. Again, more here in chapter 1 and verse 3. The time is at hand, he says. We understand what that means. I say that, that my Bible is at hand. It means it's near. It's somewhere close to me. That's the description he's using here. In chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, it's Jesus saying, I come quickly. We see in chapter 22 and verse 6, the, the things that must, uh, which must shortly come to pass. In chapter 22 and verse 7, again, Jesus says, I come quickly. In chapter 22 and verse 10, here's an important passage because here, John is told, he says, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. 
Now this is in contrast, if you have studied the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, when Daniel is concluding his prophetic writing for God, God tells Daniel, he says, But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. The message for Daniel was the things that are being written about in this book are not going to happen for a long time. They're not, it's, this is not for a people for right now. It may be hundreds of years, and it was hundreds of years, before the things that Daniel was writing began to be fulfilled and we begin to see those things happen. And so God was telling Daniel, seal up these words because this is not for now. That's the exact opposite of what God tells John in the Revelation. He specifically and emphatically tells John, do not seal up the words of, of the, the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. So we see over and over and over throughout the book, especially at the very beginning and the end, that God is giving us a message that the things in this book are things that are about to happen soon. That helps us to understand the overall message of the book. Thirdly, the book of Revelation is given to comfort persecuted Christians. It's said that there is the blood of Christians is seen on every single page of the book of Revelation. In, let's just kind of walk through this real quick. You, as you, you'll see this. In chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, I am a partaker with you in the tribulation. All of chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters to the churches of Asia, five out of the seven letters uh, of those, to those churches speak of persecution. In chapter 6 and verse 9, it talks about the souls of those beheaded for their testimony of Jesus Christ. In chapter 7 and verse 14, it speaks of those in heaven who came out of the great tribulation. Chapter 11 and verse 7 speaks of the death of the two witnesses who were witnesses for God. In chapter 12 and verse 17, it speaks of a war on those who testify of Jesus. In chapter 13, in verse 7, it says that it is given to him to make war on the saints for 42 months. In chapter 13, verse 15, the second beast of the Revelation appears. It says that he will kill those who rule or, or who refuse to worship the first beast. Both in chapter 17 and chapter 19, we see a, the harlot. It says that she spills the blood of the saints. In chapter 18 and verse 24, the blood of the saints are spilled in Babylon. In chapter 20 and verse 4, the souls of those beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. You see, throughout the entire revelation, we see this message of persecution, of pain, of death that is taking place amongst Christians, the saints, the people of God. That is one overall message that runs all the way through the book of Revelation. There's so much persecution. Now, one of the great things is, is that we, as we see all of the persecution that takes place, one of the, uh, the, another great message of the book is God giving a message of hope. To let those know who are going through the persecution that it's only going to be temporary. And that actually brings us to our next point. And that is that the book of Revelation identifies this number, 1260 days. We, we saw an example there in one of those passages we just read a moment ago. But this is a very unique and it is a very specific number used in the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, you see this written in different ways. 1260 days is the same as 42 months. The passage we read a moment ago in, in chapter 13 and verse 7 what used the, the 42 months. 42 months is the same as three and a half years. There's places in the Revelation that uses that number, three and a half years. It also uses the, uh, we'll see the description that a time, time, and half a time. That's also another description of this number. 
And so this is a number that appears throughout the Revelation, and it's kind of strange. Why don't you just say it one way all the way through? Well, again, it's a picture. It's the same number, and that's really the point that God wants us to see, is that I'm talking about the same thing. Even though I'm using different words to, to describe it, I'm referring to the same type of thing. Well, we just saw all of the persecution that Christians are going through throughout the entire book of Revelation. Within Revelation, these numbers, these types of numbers are used five different times. And those five times are all right in the middle, every single time of a period of persecution. So whenever you're going through the book of Revelation and you're studying this, you begin to realize this number, this time period that is being given by God has something to do with persecution. Now, three and a half years is an incomplete period of time. And so it's a message that is being given to these people to let them know that the persecution, the context of this number, the persecution you're going through is going to be incomplete. It's not going to be a full persecution where everyone is is killed and and the the, the work of God is completely done away with. It's incomplete. And so when you go through the book of Revelation, when you see this number or these different ways of, of stating this number, look for that. Look to see, first of all, where it is in the context always in the middle of a per time of persecution. And then then begin looking for the message of hope that comes immediately after this number is used because it's there each and every time. As a matter of fact, that example that we mentioned a moment ago, this is one example. That the beast makes war on the church for 42 months. So we see this reference right connected directly to a time of persecution where the church is is suffering greatly. This is also another important uh, aspect of understanding what is this book really all about. It's important to know. It's symbolic. It's something that is going to happen soon after John writes this, this book. It is, it's given to give comfort to those that are Christians who are being persecuted because they were going through so much Many times they might wonder, why is this happening to us? And God is letting them know there's a purpose, there's a reason. It's going to be incomplete, but you're going to have to go through some of this for a while. And he gives that number just as a symbol to help them understand that. The next point, we'll spend a little bit of time here, is that it identifies the characters of the book of Revelation. I love the way that Stafford North describes this. He describes the book of Revelation as a drama. It's like you're going to a play. And every time that you go to a play, one of the most important things that all playwrights, those that are authors of of plays know, is you have to do a great job of developing the characters that are in that play. If you don't know who the people are or what their purpose is in the drama, in the play, then you really you lose interest in what's going on, you kind of get lost, and, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, God does the same thing with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is actually a play that is seen in two acts. The first act is from chapter 4 and verse 9. The second act, there's an, and there's even an intermission in between the two when you study through it and see how it is all laid out. And then the second act begins in chapter 9 and runs through the rest of the book. Like I said, just like every drama, the writer spends a lot of time describing all of these characters. And when we open the Revelation, there's a lot of characters, a lot of strange characters, trying to understand exactly who they are. I think, especially by looking at this first one, that this will begin to show you that there are some strange things in the book of Revelation, but they're not hard to understand. As a matter of fact, again, if we let the Bible interpret itself. We don't have to guess. We don't have to assume. Just let the Bible tell you what it is. And then you're able to have a better understanding of where to go from there. So the dragon is one of the first characters that appears on the scene. 
We see the dragon in chapter 12 in verse 3 for the first time. This dragon, the description that's given of this dragon is that he has seven heads and ten horns. It says that he is waiting for a child to be born. It says that his tail sweeps a third of the stars from the sky. He attempts to devour the child when that child that he's waiting for is born. It says that he empowers two beasts to do his bidding. It tells us later on that he's bound in the abyss for a thousand years. And that ultimately he is cast into the lake of fire. Who is and what is this dragon? There are two places. If you have your Bibles, turn to one of these places. I'll tell you, Revelation chapter 12 is my favorite chapter. Is one of the most picturesque, one of the most active chapters in the Revelation. But it is actually telling the entire story of the plan of God concerning His plan for Christ, the Messiah, from beginning to end in this one chapter. It's an amazing chapter. When you really begin to, to look at everything in the proper context. Okay, if you look at either Revelation 12, 9 or Revelation 20 and verse 2, who is the dragon? It tells you right there. It's Satan. I don't have to guess. I don't have to assume. I don't have to throw an opinion out of what I think this might represent. God has told us two times in the book of Revelation who the, the dragon represents. So, in the book of Revelation, when you're studying the book, every time you see the word dragon... If you're a Bible marker like I am, right in the margin, Satan. You know exactly who it is. And that is going to help you to be able to understand the bigger picture of what's going on within those contexts. Let's look at another character. This one takes a little bit more um, digging, but it is very obvious by the images that God gives. There are two beasts that the dragon calls up to help him with his... his persecution of, of Christians. And the first one, first beast, is, um, just, think about the context here. We see this in him for the first time in chapter 13. In chapter 12, we see the dragon, Satan, attacking God's people. And then in chapter 13, we see the dragon bringing up these two beasts to do his dirty work, basically. And so that's the context of these chapters. The first beast is described in detail in both chapters 13 and 17. Some of the description that this gives in these two places is that he comes out of the sea. Now, remember that. That's going to come up again. He has seven heads and ten horns. His body is like a leopard. His paws are like a bear. His mouth is like a lion. And so if you think of that imagery there, a leopard and a bear and a lion, as a Bible student, where have you seen that before? Again, let the Bible interpret itself. We don't have to guess. We can go somewhere else in Scripture and we can see this exact image somewhere else. We go back to the prophecy of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel 7 verses 1 through 7, we see this picture that is laid out in a vision that Daniel is given where there are four beasts that it says come out of the sea. It says one is a lion, one is a bear, one is a leopard. But then it also says there's a fourth beast that comes up out of the sea. It's not given a description like the other three, but that it is great and it is terrible. It's a fourth, a fourth beast. Now we know what these beasts represent in, in the prophecy of Daniel. We know that God has already given Daniel, if we backed up to Daniel chapter 2, God has already given Daniel a glimpse of the future. He's brought Daniel in to interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has had this great dream of this statue that has a head of gold, that has the arms and chest of silver, that has legs of bronze, and has feet of iron and clay. 
And so Daniel then is given to interpret this dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And what we find out is Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. In other words, the Babylonian Empire, your people, you are the head of gold. But there is another nation that is weaker than you that will come in and conquer you. That weaker nation, the arms of chest and silver, we know historically that it was the Medes and the Persians that conquered the Babylonians. Then it says another will rise up and will defeat that one. The legs of bronze represent the Greeks who defeated the Persians. But then the fourth beast came up and devoured them all. Historically, that fourth kingdom we know was the, the kingdom of Rome, the Roman Empire. We see that's the dream in Daniel chapter 2. When we get to Daniel chapter 7. Most people don't study Daniel chapter 7 through chapter 12 because it looks a lot like the book of Revelation. A lot of pictures, a lot of images. We, under, we remember Daniel getting taken as a child and taken into captivity and, and not eating the food of the Babylonians that they gave them. And we remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we remember Daniel in the lion's den. That's Daniel 1 through 6. Daniel 7 is where the visions of Daniel begin. And it, they look a lot like the book of Revelation. And it's, there's a reason, because they are referring to much of the same things. We see here in Daniel 7, this image of these four beasts that come up out of the sea. These are representing the same empires that the dream represented. It's just God uses a different symbol to represent them. And the way that he does it is amazing. Get on Google and Google the Lion of Babylon. The lion, of, the lion was a symbol of Babylon. And so the very first beast that's described here, is it shocking that it's a lion? The next beast is a bear. You wonder what type of animal represented the Persian army. It just so happens it was a bear. Then it is the Greeks, a leopard. You know why the Greeks were represented by a leopard? Because Alexander the Great had built an army that was so much faster they could move across the land faster than any other military had ever done before that's why they were so powerful and they were they were known as the leopard alexander the great himself even known as that leopard so is it a surprise that this kingdom that's coming up out of the sea is represented as a leopard well, we see all of the pieces all fitting together it all makes sense you yeah you need to know a little bit of history you need to know your, your uh, study, the book of Daniel, to see some of these things as well. But is that not what we're supposed to do? Are we not supposed to study all of God's Word to be able to understand all of God's Word to the best of our ability? And that's really what God is doing. I've already given you the answer of what this represents. I've already had a prophet tell you what this represents. And now he's giving it to them again. So those that he's writing to, John is writing to originally in the first century, they know the book of Daniel. They understand those writings. They hear those things. And so they are immediately making these connections. Again, we're further removed. We're not in that culture. We're not in that time. It's a little bit different for us than it was for them, but we can still see it when we look at the book itself. Now, Revelation's first beast, as we see, it's identical to Daniel's fourth beast. The fourth beast of Daniel, that fourth kingdom, was, uh, we know historically, the Roman Empire. So when we go back here to Re Revelation chapter 13, from verses 5 through 7, there's some more description that we get. It kind of builds on this picture. It says that this beast makes war on the saints. It says that he has universal authority. This beast has, has all, um, uh, all worship this beast. And so here we have just some more imagery, some more pictures of what's happening around this beast. If we jump forward to chapter 17, verses 9 through 10, we get more description of this beast. And this is actually a little bit more detailed. It says that the seven heads, remember it has seven heads and ten horns? 
The seven heads represent both seven kings and seven hills. Both of those are given here. So we know, first of all, this isn't literal heads because in the description it says, no, it's a, it's a, in a figurative image. The seven heads, first it represents seven kings. And he goes through this description that five kings are in the past, one is, and one is yet to come. So we're actually able to look now, while John was writing the book of Revelation, he says here that one of these kings is king now. We just have a timeline marker that's been given to us. If we will look and see who was the emperor of Rome at the time John was writing this book, then we're going to know who that king is that is, and who the one that is to come, who that will be. We can also see who the five were that came before him. And historically, it all fits perfectly. It's amazing. But yet, then he gives, he says, the, the seven heads also represent seven hills. Now, if you are up on your history, then you might be aware of one specific city in the world that was built on seven hills. There's only one that's known for that, the city of Rome. That description fits perfectly as well with what we're talking about. So if you put all of this together, the first beast of the book of Revelation has universal power at the time that the book of Revelation was written. It is persecuting Christians. Its heads are kings that are worshipped by all. What was happening in the Roman Empire with the emperors? The emperors were having people bow down and worship them because they declared themselves as gods. It is connected to seven hills. Seven hills in a reference to the city of Rome. And it looks identical to the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. So who is the first beast in the story of the book of Revelation? It's not hard to see. It's actually very vividly and clearly painted for us to be able to understand that the first beast of the book of Revelation is the Roman Empire. That's a vital thing to know and understand when you're trying to get the whole picture of what this book is really all about. Now, why not just come out and say, Satan used the Roman Empire? Why not do that? It would be a whole lot easier. We wouldn't have to have all these people coming up with weird ideas about what all of these images meant. Well, just think about what was happening there in the first century with Christians. Because what does the end of the book of Revelation say about the dragon and the first beast? It says that they are destroyed. So if you were a Christian in the first century walking around with a book that said that the Roman Empire is going to be destroyed, what's going to happen to you? What God did in His amazing wisdom, by putting all these things in pictures, pictures and images that the Christians, students of the Bible, that they would understand, but a Roman citizen or a Roman leader, if they were to open it up and begin reading it, they wouldn't have a clue as to what it meant. That was part of the purpose to protect those that this message was written to. They were already going through enough persecution. And so God was doing this to help protect them from anything else happening that didn't need to. Uh, you, can, uh, you can do the same. We're not going to have the time when I normally do this series of lessons. I go through the same type of walkthrough for the second beast for the harlot of, of chapter 17. And I walk through all of those and see everything that's given, looking at historical and, and factual things in context, and you're, you're actually able to do the same thing with those two. Begins to give you a clear picture of the book of Revelation. I want to conclude with this, this key. That the book of Revelation, it speaks of a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. Many who look at the book of Revelation are looking at it in a context that God is still yet to establish His kingdom. 
saying that when God's original plan to set up His kingdom, when He sent His Son to this earth, the Jews rejected Him. And so He was not able to set up His kingdom and Jesus reign as King here on this earth. What we find when we read Scripture is that that was never God's intent. That was never God's plan. We see right here in the book of Revelation even, in chapter 1 and verse 6, it says that He made us to be a kingdom and priests. Now this, the way that John writes this is important. He's including Himself. He made us to be a kingdom and priests. But it's also written in the past tense that it's something that has already happened. The kingdom has already been established. We are already a part of the kingdom and we are already his priests. So when John wrote the Revelation, probably around 90 to 95, maybe as late as 97 AD, the kingdom was already in existence and it had already been established. You can even drop down just a few verses to chapter 1 and verse 9. And again, John says uh, uh, that he is a part partaker in the kingdom. The kingdom is already there, and I'm a partaker in this kingdom with you, he says. This fits exactly the things that we see throughout the New Testament. Some of the very clear messages that we see, like in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, it says... Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, there are some who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Jesus, speaking to that crowd, he tells them very clearly, there are some of you who are standing here today who will not die until you see the kingdom come. Jesus made a promise. The kingdom is going to be established in your lifetime. In John chapter 18, as Jesus is put on trial, he's standing before Pilate. And Pilate is asking Jesus things about his kingdom. Are you a king? They say that you're a king. And Jesus makes this statement in John chapter 18 and verse 36. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. There's only two realms. The physical realm and the spiritual realm. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this realm. And he was in the physical realm. So Jesus is making a statement that his kingdom was not intended to be one that was here in the physical world. And then, then that really only leaves us one option. Jesus always intended for that kingdom to be a spiritual kingdom. There are many who believe that God failed to set up his kingdom that he planned the first time. I have a lot of issues with that. Just by saying that God failed is a big problem with me because I know that my God cannot fail. He will not fail. Whatever God's plan is, it will be. If God planned to establish His kingdom, that's exactly what He did. For those today say it didn't work out the first time, and so what God did was He, he kind of called an audible. He put a plan B together. I'll set up my church for now here to be my people here on earth, and then I'll have Jesus set up His kingdom sometime in the future. There is nowhere in the pages of Scripture that teach that. Not in the context of each and every one of the, the Scriptures that talk about the kingdom of God. As we see John's description, the kingdom is already in existence. It's, this is a, a neat study to do. If you begin studying the New Testament, going through the teaching of Jesus, begin looking for every time they, they mention the kingdom, all the way through the New Testament. As you see Jesus in the very beginning talking about, my kingdom is at hand. He's preaching that the kingdom is coming. And it's all in the future tense. I'm not going to tell you where and when. I want you to find it yourself. But there is a certain time in Scripture 
when it's no longer referred to in the future tense anymore. There's a couple of places where it's talking about heaven, that the kingdom of heaven is in the future tense. But the, this kingdom that God was going to establish, there's a point in Scripture in the New Testament when now it is only referred to in the past tense as though it has already been established. That's an important point for a study of the entire New Testament. So we see many who believe these things about God failing. They think that Jesus is going to establish His physical throne in His physical city here in, on this earth in Jerusalem. He's going to reign for a literal, physical thousand years here on this earth. This cannot be so. Because Jesus said this was never His intention. My kingdom is not of this world. That doesn't mean it's not of this world now and it might be later. It's not of this world. It's not of this realm. The book of Revelation tells us the kingdom is, is not something that we are waiting for, but it's something that already exists. So when we look at the book of Revelation as a whole, the only view that is consistent with the book of Revelation and the rest of Scripture is this, this view of the fall of Rome. So when we see this, it, it fits. Everything fits. The symbols fit. We see that the, the images, the, the things that God describes, it's going to happen shortly within their lifetime from the time that it was written. We see that take place with the persecution the Romans place upon the Christians. It's, it's the right identity for all the characters of the Revelation. When you look at history and you look at what happened during that time, all of the characters fit perfectly. It describes the spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom, which also agrees with what the rest of Scripture teaches. So. The Roman view of the book of Revelation is the only correct way to interpret this book. Now, there are a lot of things that we didn't talk about in the book of Revelation. I do an entire series of going through all of this. Uh, again, trying to do it as, as well as I can in the, the, the pattern that Stafford North had done it. But what does the Revelation mean to me? The overall view here of the Revelation is it's a book that was written to Christians in the first century. It was written to them to let them know that God understands. The persecution the Roman Empire was putting on them was something that God knew was going to happen. When you get to Revelation chapter 6, we see the saints that are under the altar in the throne room of God, and they're pleading with God, how long are you going to let this happen? And God says, you're going to have to wait a little longer, because more are going to have to die first. Now, to our minds, our human minds, that doesn't make any sense. How is that something, a plan of, of a loving God? But what God understood was that the persecution of His people was actually going to be a victory for his kingdom. Every single one who died because of their faith in Jesus Christ, they are now eternally with their God. They have won the battle. They have already accomplished what every single one of us wants to accomplish someday. That's not failure, that's victory. But then also, God understood something that no one else could see. The persecution of His church would actually not end in a diminishing of His people. As the church was persecuted by the Romans, the church grew. The Roman people and the Roman Empire, they saw Christians who were being marched to their death because they would not renounce the name of Jesus Christ. And other Roman citizens, they began to think, what is so amazing about this Jesus? That they will not deny Him. That they will go to their death singing praises for Him. And more and more people began to learn about Jesus Christ and what He means for them and how He can save their soul. 
and the church grew. When the Roman persecution ended, the church was hundreds of times bigger than it was when the persecution began. What Satan tried to do by using the Roman Empire, the beast, the dragon using the beast, Satan tried to use the Roman Empire to crush and squelch the church, and it backfired. And God knew that it would. And so what didn't make sense to humans made sense to God. He knew exactly what would happen. He knew that that would be victory no matter what. That's what the book of Revelation is about. It tells that story. It gives the warnings to Christians where God's saying, I know you're in pain. I know you're hurting. And there's more to come. But you need to understand, at the end of the book, we win. This is victor, a book of victory, not of defeat. And that's what the Revelation lays out. So what is it what does it really mean for us today? Well, first of all, this is one of the most awe-inspiring letters that is written to first century Christians for us to look at and to see how amazing God is. That even when it doesn't seem possible for there to be success and victory, God ends up being victorious. It is an awesome message that God, God shows us. The futurist view, the premillennial view, doesn't fit because they want, want to make all of the symbols and the, of the language literal things that are going to take place. That's not how the Revelation was written. It doesn't work like that. The futurist view would, would not fit the number of times the Revelation says that it must soon take place. Revelation, being such an amazing letter and seeing all the things that God has done, doesn't just give that description of what they're going to be doing with per, through the persecution, but we see that message of hope. We see the awesome power and the wisdom of God. We see that even when we are going through trials, when we're going through maybe our own persecution because of our faith in Jesus, that is no reason to give up. It's actually a reason to take a stand and to stand firm. To the seven churches of Asia that are in the first uh, chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, at the end of each one of those letters, they all end with the statement, to him who overcomes. And then God describes what the promise, what the gift, what the reward to those who overcome would be. At the end of every single one, to the church in Ephesus and Smyrna and Thyatira and Pergamum, all those churches, at the end of every single one, he ends with, to him who overcomes. That message is powerful, and it's still a message that is real and vital in our lives still today. The book of Revelation is an encouragement for us today because we see the awesome power of God. We see that even when it seems like Satan is winning, he's really not. Satan has already lost the war. He's still fighting some battles, but he's already lost the war. And he knows it. And he's going to try to do anything and everything in our lives to try to win us back. Because if he can defeat individual ones of us, go back to Revelation 12, and you'll see that the dragon is now focused on the individual children of the woman, God's people, that are represented. That's you and me. That's where his focus is now. And the Revelation lays that out and shows us that. We can look back in history and we can see how the book of Revelation fits perfectly with what happened in the first two or three centuries. And we can marvel at how amazing and accurate the Bible actually is. We can also see in the Revelation that the hope that our first century brethren were given is the same hope that we have to look forward to if we will overcome if we will remain faithful to our God. That's the message of the book of Revelation. There is a point at the end of the book of Revelation that we find a, a place to where there is a point that is still promises of what is yet to come. There is a promise of eternal life that has not taken place yet. 
And God gives a vivid description of that city that is four square that comes down out of heaven. It is a beautiful picture to show what eternal life is really going to be. That promise is something that is still yet to come. But that's the only thing. The majority of the book of Revelation is pointing us back in time to take a look at what God's plan was for His people, even though they would suffer a lot. But God letting them know, remain faithful and we will win. Remain strong and you will overcome. If you stay faithful, you will be victorious. And that's the message. Look at the world around us today. People are, they're hungering and thirsting for a message that tells them that there's hope, that there is something better than what we're dealing with in the world today. As Christians, our citizenship is not here on this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven with our God. So when we take a book like the book of Revelation, we can see more and more of how amazing that God that we serve really is. I hope that this has helped, maybe just to give a little bit of a glimpse of an overall picture of the book of Revelation. There's so much more to dig into. There's so much more to look at. We just scratch the scratch of the scratch in what we talked about tonight. But continue to look. Don't give up. Don't be afraid. Let the Bible interpret itself and use what God has already given you to understand what God has given you. It's the best way to study your Bible. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I know that for many of those who may be watching, those that are here, there's always a church here in Hydro. I know the whole purpose of this series of lessons is they, have, they care they care about the people. You don't go into a community and begin to ask the people of the community, what are some questions that maybe we can help you find concern that, that, that we can find in the Bible? It's an amazing thing to see that there are people in your community that have a love for you, that want to reach out to you and see what concerns you. We can stand up here and preach what we want to preach all day long because it's what we want to hear. It says a lot for those who are willing to hear what you need in your life. And you'll find some amazing, loving people that will wrap their arms around you and help you with the things that are taking place in your life, if you will. I know that we have an invitation song tonight. If there is anyone here that there's something in your life, I need to remain strong. I've got to overcome this world. There's something that the church here if they can pray and encourage and strengthen you because it's going to take all of us together the army of God working together we see that in the book of Revelation it takes takes all of us to strengthen each other so that we can overcome this world and so that we can enjoy the next one together if there's any need at all you can make that known tonight if you'll come forward as we stand as we sing this song